You, like me, probably dream of what you'd do if you won the lottery this weekend. A cool two or three million pounds would do the trick nicely. There'd be that dream house and then the tricky decision of which supercar to buy. Ferrari, Porsche, Bentley, or how about this, the Aston Martin DB7 Volante at a cost of a cool £90,000. But is this Aston Martin really a good choice in terms of living with the car and driving it? Well, there's no doubt it is a beautiful car to look at. Perhaps not as beautiful as the coupe, but once the hood goes down, you get some very envious looks from passers-by, believe me, and lovely little details like this. I was quite surprised at how small the car actually looks. I expected it to be much longer. Now, the engineers at Bloxham, just outside Banbury, where the car is built, made significant developments over the coupe, and that includes 600 new components, many of which have now found themselves into the DB7 coupe too. Now, when you cut the roof off a car, obviously, you lose a lot of rigidity, and that's why reinforcements, cross braces, and gussets have been added to the Volante, plus a softer suspension aimed particularly at the US market. So where does the name DB7 actually come from? Well, DB are the initials of Aston Martin's founder, David Brown, who ran an engineering firm and then went on to actually make tractors. It was during the 50s and 60s that Aston Martin really took off, with a Le Mans victory in 1959, and then production of classics like the DB4, 5 and 6. And of course, James Bond's favourite of those was that DB5. After the war, Aston Martin were not in the healthiest of positions and were put up for sale at a relatively bargain price. David Brown went along and was impressed with a prototype they'd called the Atom, but it was crying out for a better engine. Another great pre-war mark, Lagonda, also caught David Brown's eye. And for two of its engineers, Willie Watson and Donald Baston, under the supervision of W.O. Bentley, the father of Bentley Motors and mastermind behind their great Le Mans victories, they designed an excellent new straight-six engine for Lagonda. Now, this engine caught David Brown's eye, and after some protracted negotiations, Aston Martin and Lagonda came under the same umbrella. Now under the bonnet of the DB7 is that 3.2 litre straight six engine coupled with the Eaton supercharger. It produces 335 brake horsepower and although the Volante is a lot heavier than the coupe, still produces a very respectable 0 to 60 time of six and a half seconds, top speed of over 150 miles per hour. Now for me, this manual gearbox is far too much like hard work. The clutch is fairly heavy and gear shifting needs precision and care. And personally, I definitely choose the automatic box. Now the hood is very simple and easy to open. It goes down even faster than Monica Lewinsky, allegedly anyway. You just release these two catches here, push them back, press the button, and it glides perfectly back into place. You don't get that snug fit that you do on the Mercedes SL because the designers wanted that all important space in the back for two sets of golf clubs. Now little niggles about the DB7 which apply both to the coupe and to this the Volante, these dreadful switches here which believe it or not are actually for the cruise control although you'd never believe it, not only do they look naff, they don't tell you what they do and that applies to the other switches on the dashboard too. Also the rear seats are nothing short of useless to be honest, you can get very small children in there for a very short space of time but you wonder on a car like this why they even bother to put rear seats in. Also the radio cassette machine, great radio cassette machine but when you're cruising on the motorway in fifth like that you can't change cassettes which is rather irritating. There's also very little space in the footwells for the driver. The pedals are quite severely offset, I've found. There is space there to rest your foot whilst you're cruising on the motorway, but no foot rest. And also, it's not a car for men with big feet. Shortly before he died, David Brown saw the new DB7 project and gave it his seal of approval, bringing the DB connection full circle to the new golden era in Aston Martin's revival under Ford. Well, I may not quite be the latest Bond girl material, but Terry Hatcher, you can eat your heart out because I'm about to get a sneak preview of the car that could well be James Bond's latest set of wheels. So what is it? 
Well, its name is The Vantage and it's an Aston Martin. And if there's any justice at all in this world, this should be the car that lures James Bond away from the Germans and back behind the wheel of what, after all, is traditionally his favourite mark. From first glance, it seems to me to have so much heritage. It's really evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Is that what you're trying to do? Is the mark very important to you? Yeah, we've tried to take some of the classic Aston themes and refresh them and restate them in, in, a, in a modern way. And I'm glad you think we've succeeded. You're obviously working in a close partnership with Ford. And how much of their technology will go into this? Because it's a fast, high-performance thing, isn't it? Yeah, but we're not going to make it. We had, this is a concept and we're going to use it as a rolling laboratory. But the answer to your question is Ford have helped us tremendously. Um, we already work on the DB7 with Ford in the area of electronics, composite materials, engine uh, and gearbox. So we get a tremendous amount of support. What Ford get is that we can demonstrate technology on a car which is low volume and sells worldwide. So if you like, we can be a technology demonstrator for them. So it's a good partnership. I'm sorry, it's a good partnership. No, it is, it's important. So what about some of the statistics then? Because this is, it's a real high performance vehicle, isn't it? Well, we haven't driven it that hard yet. Um, and we've done very few miles. But what we can do, because we've got very good software, is that we can predict this car will exceed 200 miles an hour. And the 0 to 60 time will be around four seconds. Standing quarter in about, uh, well, I don't know, exit the standing quarter at 140 miles an hour. So it should be quick enough for most of our customers. There's a very strong motorsport influence there, and I believe that Jackie Stewart's Grand Prix team have been involved along the way. Is that true? Well, the technology we share, the main technology is probably the, uh, the paddle shift. So you can actually change gear by working paddles on the steering wheel without taking a hand off the wheel. So it's good for safety as well as for very fast gear changes. This is a big boy's toy, isn't it, Bob? <laughs> <clears throat> to some degree, all Astons are big boy's toys in the sense that uh, they're for people who are successful, who are modern, who are international, and, and who love quality things. So, yes, if you want to describe it that way, yes. Of course, one of the real British icons who loves his big boy's toys is James Bond. Do you think this could be the car that would lure him back into an Aston? Which is, come on, it's what he belongs in, really, isn't it? I'd love to... Uh, for him to drive this car in the next Bond film, but uh, we'll have to see. Would you let him drive the concept? Well, if the price was right, I guess we'd have to. James Bond, if you don't take that offer up, you must be absolutely mad. And what a job to be faced with, though, designing a, a new vehicle for Aston Martin. Is something that incredibly daunting to a designer, or is it like the exciting dream job? It's both, really. I mean, it's extremely daunting because you have a huge responsibility. It's got to be right. You know, you, you can't blow it. It's got to be absolutely right. And the chance to design cars like this happens so, so seldom that um, you have to make the most of it. But it's extremely exciting. I mean, to, to get the job to design a two-seater sports car is every, every designer's dream, it's every schoolboy's dream. And when you get the chance to do it, it's a wonderful feeling. But you have to work very, very hard at it because, uh, as I say, it, at the end of the day, um, you have to portray the spirit that you feel when you're actually producing it. And it's so easy to lose that. So it's, uh... There's so much talk today about cars being designed by computer, it's all high-tech. I mean, how much of that is really true? Or does it come from within and it's inspirations from around you or the heritage of the mark? Well, I mean, we use computers an awful lot in the process of designing cars, but the spirit of any design has to come from the designer, it has to come from the heart and the mind, it has to come from the influences, it has to come from the heritage of the car itself. What I've got to do is to make it so irresistible that somewhere along the line somebody turn around and say, yes, let's make this. But at the moment, there are no plans. When we design the car, I design a car very much from a pragmatic point of view. I mean, it's a very emotive thing, but I got to understand how it's going to be made, um, the, roughly the volumes a car like this would be made in. So it's very important that um, I design it in a way, from my point of view, much as anything else, that I know it's going to work. This car, for instance, is completely legal. Uh, whereas a lot of show cars, you could actually find areas where they're illegal. So just details like that, and also the construction of this car is very important. We know how it's uh, put together. It's got a very advanced uh, process of, of, of construct chassis construction, mm -hmm. suspension construction. So all that stuff is, uh, is real and it makes the car so much more beautiful knowing what's underneath it. One of the first people to drive the new Aston Martin concept was Jacques Nasser, president of the Ford Automotive Group. Well, it was a, just a dramatic shock to me. It was mouth-watering to, to see the tautness of the body and uh, it was parked right beside uh, the DB7, which I think is one of the most wonderful designs uh, on wheels today in the automotive industry. And yet it just made the DB7 look 
a little soft, uh, not as dramatic as uh, as I'm used to seeing it. So it was uh, it was quite a sensation for me to see it. Just as we went over the hill, and there it was uh, in the little uh, parking spot uh, waiting for us. It, it was a wonderful sight. After the break, is the famous DB7 really worth £40,000 more than Jaguar's XK8? John Stanley will investigate. This is Western Manor in Oxfordshire. It's originally the home of 11th century monks. It's now a thriving hotel called Western Manor. And it manages to combine the power of history with the panelled rooms. It's even got its own ghost called Maud. It has everything you would expect of a period house and yet at the same time offers modern facilities without which it wouldn't hold its customers. The panelling of course wasn't original, it was added somewhat later and by all accounts the ghost was really a local lady who came to entertain the monks. And what's this got to do with motor cars? Well we're expecting much the same of our current crop of sporting pedigreed motor cars. There are lots of pieces of history woven into them and lots of criticisms because there is. Come and see for yourself what we have through this arch. Here we have two motoring legends, both trading heavily on their pasts and both attacking the modern marketplace ferociously. There's a difference, it's about £40,000 and if you're a fan of one or the other, you feel pretty strongly. The one thing is certain that until now, these two cars haven't been shown together very often because they do look so similar. In the blue corner, we have the XK8, Jaguar's new glamorous car, complete with its brand new V8 engine and carrying those famous XK initials that is part of its history. And in the silver corner, we have the DB7, the seriously glamorous, best-selling Aston Martin, complete with its 3.2 supercharged engine, equally well trading on its DB past. Considering the £40,000 price difference between them, they're not really rivals, and yet they are in exactly the same market. Which is best? Which would suit you if you were dreaming? In 1961, Jaguar launched the E-Type in Geneva, the motor show. And with all the suitable show business finales, they did the same thing again in 1996 with the XK8. The basic bestseller that they have achieved in sports car terms until this car was the XKS and the XKS platform was central to the design of this car. They have provided a beautiful new body and a lot of sex on the road but it is genuinely a Grand Tourer. It dismisses itself as a sports car because it has a big boot. A boot that you can take all your weekend stuff away in as well as your other half. The inside is everything you would expect a Jaguar to be. It is beautifully fitted, which is a change because some of their previous cars fell apart. Their electrics used to be bad news. Now, I'm pleased to say the inside is lovely. There are all the features you expect. There's the veneer, there is the leather trim, there is the carpet. Some of it's a little on the tacky side. Steering wheel is a good case in point. There's no real need for part wood, part leather, unless it wants to look good in a brochure. The travelling in this machine is splendid. It is extremely comfortable. The suspension has set itself up as a touring car. And really, although it looks like an outright sports car, it is a very grand means of transport. The pedals are nicely spaced. There is a huge rest for your left foot for these long journeys where you don't need to be doing a lot. There is excellent audio facilities with controls on the wheel so you can move your audio up and down and answer your phone and play all the games that Jaguar drivers like too. The air conditioning is clean and simple. It's very easy to dial up and down with just one knob. It's a fully automatic box, five speed, and to many people that's a shame with Jaguars. But in fact, their J gate gives you the option of either. In manual form, it's not really as fast or as enjoyable as a manual box could be, but in truth, kept in sport, 
it really is a lively drive without having to be busy. The needless to say there are a lot of buttons and dials and all the things you'd expect. There is one which as yet I haven't figured out. It's called Valley and it's here. I haven't had a drink served yet. And in the rear there is at least a token space. I have driven the automatic convertible and there you don't have that space facility because it's all hood. But right now in the coupe you do have usable space, whether it's for suitcases or those tiny children with no legs. And under this bonnet, we have the really serious news. This is Jaguar's beautiful new V8 engine. It creates 290 brake horse. It's a four litre machine and it is silky smooth. Just come and see. Now driving this Jaguar is definitely an experience. You get the feeling that it's a sports car, you have the long bonnet, you have the big sexy wheel, all the instrumentation you want around you, and yet, in fact, the gear changes are so smooth that you really don't know which gear you're in. It just glides. If you want fun, then clearly you've got to behave yourself because these cars are not really for the road at full speed. But if you do drop it down a cog or two, and you do start listening to this lovely V8 that is the first Jaguars have actually created, then you can understand why the sporting enthusiast is celebrating what was originally going to be called the F-Type. It in fact has in midsection quite a lot that it borrows from the race car, the XK813, which actually never made it into production. It's a very smooth package and it is wonderful for long road journeys where you don't want to concentrate all the time on driving but when you do want a bit of fun and you drop it down a gig, you can push it. And the revs climb and it's fun suddenly. So that was Jaguar's offering and this is the Aston Martin. Yes, it's based on the same platform. It was still an XKS in its, in its nucleus. But this was designed by Ian Cullen, who had a DB4 in the design studio with him throughout for his own inspiration and to make sure that he perpetrated all the same things. These lines on the sides, which were on those cars, the headlight fairings, all the same styling codes. The style is beautiful, it's slippery, it's very, very fast but it does trade on the past. Its Grand Touring credentials are adequate. They're not as good as the Jaguars, but they are weekend equipment at the very least. And inside, well, they've managed most of the tradition, along with a few little extras like veneer, which not too many Aston Martin fans seem to remember having. The control panel is functional and it's traditional. They're lovely beautiful dials, they look and feel like Aston Martin and they tell you exactly what you want to know. Some of the other information is a little more confused. The radio and cassette deck are definitely not belonging in this car. I can't get a cassette in if you're in top gear or you're in first gear and on a motorway that's not ideal. The door handles are definitely a surprise. Anyone who owns a Mazda MX-5 will recognize them instantly. They don't belong on an 80,000 pound Grand Tourer. As to the pedals, they're a serious shock. There is no rest on the left for these long journeys you're apparently able to do in this car. And the throttle, which inevitably is going to be somewhere near the floor, if you are in trouble, you can't get it past the brake. They've taken the corner off it to try and assist you, but it's a very long way up and over and every time you catch it. And under here is definitely Aston's pride and joy. It is a 3.2 supercharged engine. It's twin cam, it's built by Tom Walkinshaw. It is a real flyer. It's definitely what you're buying. This one may cost an awful lot more money than the opposition, but when you actually start stirring these gears, you know why. The 
The supercharged engine develops over 300 brake horse and it's there all the way through. It doesn't have the excitement of a turbocharger which will suddenly give you a belt in the back. It's there right the way through. And if you love motoring, and if you've ever dreamt of an Aston Martin, this is definitely the one. I've driven this car and the Jaguar for a thousand miles for next year's Stanley Classic Car Yearbook, trying to judge whether they genuinely are future classics, or whether they're just trading on the past. It seems, having had both of them for a serious period now, that both of them have succeeded just as that hotel has in encompassing the ghosts from the past and the best of what is in the future. It really is a delight to drive a car like this and thank God Ford have put the money into both of them. So, which one would you buy? There's definitely horses for courses. There are followers of Jaguar and followers of Aston Martin, and those people will always be sure which they would buy. The truth is that these are both grand touring cars. The Jaguar will undoubtedly take you from A to B in great style and great comfort, and you'll arrive at the other end quickly and safely. The Aston Martin, truthfully, is flawed. It will do the same thing. It will be a little bit more rugged about getting you there. The gearbox is definitely a bit of a struggle. The pedals are a bit of a maze. But if your passion is for driving hard and the corners invite you, then in the end, it's going to be the Aston. There isn't a clear winner between these two because they are genuinely designed for different markets. A very shrewd Ford Motor Company saw that both these companies needed more money than they could individually justify. They've used a basic idea and taken it in two different directions. And it's the Ford Motor Company who are in the end the winners because they have found in the Aston Martin DB7 their all-time best-selling Aston. It's an, a younger age group than the other Aston drivers and therefore they will keep them. And with Jaguar, they have done exactly the same thing. The Jaguar is now the best-selling Jaguar sports car of all time. And both these are new. Just like Maud, who haunts this place, so the histories of Aston Martin and Jaguar are haunting these two models. We don't mind that any more than we mind the ghost or the panel room. We enjoy those elements of the past, as long as the service and what you get from them is good. And with both these two, Ford have definitely found winners.